again and give thanks to the Lord for that ministry. And Father, we do give you thanks that, uh, that there is no one outside of uh, your capacity to love, to reach, to draw, and that there is no one exempt because of our past. And we all rejoice in that truth that nobody, nobody's past exempts them from uh, your love and, and the salvation that you offer to us through Christ on the cross. And God, thank you for uh, those who are going in, like Carol and Miriam and others who are weekly going in to open up your word that this demographic of people would have the opportunity to hear and see and receive Christ and to be indwelt by your spirit. God, thank you for those who have done that and are in that place and they are witnessing to their fellow inmates. We pray that you would bring uh, a move of your Holy Spirit to sweep across not just that facility, but the county or all of the facilities where men and women are housed because of incarcerated, because of what they've done. And we pray, God, for a move of your Spirit to draw them to yourself and to bring salvation. And Lord, as we embark now upon your word, we pray that you will uh, move mightily here in the same way, that you will cause our eyes to be opened, God. Cause our ears to be opened and where there is hardness in our hearts that you would soften it and where there is dullness in our minds or lack of understanding that you will bring that clarity, that you will fill up in us what is lacking, God. We are woefully lacking. We, we need your Holy Spirit this morning so that we could see and rejoice in Christ. Guide our time by your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you to open your Bibles with me. We're going to jump right into Mark's gospel where we've been over a number of weeks now. We're uh, really in the first third. We're at the end of the first third of his gospel. And it's reminding ourselves again that Mark is writing this gospel. We're in chapter 4. We're near the end of it, verse 35. But Mark is writing this gospel to the next generation. Uh, the next generation of Christ followers who, who have uh, really are, are trying to figure out what it looks like to follow and trust and believe in Jesus Christ in a culture that is moving away from Jesus. You know, isn't that just so helpful for us to know that? That this gospel was written to us, a, a culture so similar to ours, a culture that's moving away from Christ, where it's harder and harder and harder to identify as a Christian and to walk faithfully. Mark writes this gospel to that generation. He, so he's really... Uh, by extension, he's writing this gospel to us. And so God, give us ears to hear and eyes to see, right? So verse 35, on that day when evening came, he said to them, and the, the them there is the, uh, he's been in the boat and he's been teaching. We remember this from last week. He's in the, the crowd was so great that, uh, they were pressing in, so he gets into this boat and they push out a little bit and the disciples are in the boat with him and, and other boats around. And so the evening came and he said to them, let's go across to the other side. Like, our, our work here needs to be done for now. And leaving the crowd, they took with him, with, took him with them in the boat just as he was. And other boats were with them. And, and a great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And it did. <laughs> and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to the disciples in the boat with him, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear 
and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey? And so as we're looking at this scene, we're going to look at this scene and then we're going to look at the next scene. Again, just a reminder that our, our chapter uh, headings and breaks and all of that are added later. So this scene really just is going to flow out of the scene before it. And the scene that's coming next will just really, it's all one image as we're watching it unfold. But I just wanted to pause here and he just because he's, he wraps up his teaching and he's tired, right? He says, all right, we, we need to get away from here. We need to just, like, take a little break. We're going to go to the other side of the lake. And so he, along with those disciples that are with him and the other boats around them, what do they do? They push out and they, and they start going across the sea. Um, before we dig too deeply into this, uh, into what's going on in the boat, I, I was reading through this. And, and it got to the end of this chapter, and it really kind of struck me that we could miss the forest through the trees if we're not careful. And so I wanted to take a step back and just call our attention to something that we might not otherwise notice. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it either, but I don't want us to miss it. Look at verse 35. You're looking at chapter 4, verse 35, and it says, When evening came, he'd said to them, Let's go across the lake to the other side. And now just fast forward, uh, look ahead into the middle of chapter 5. Because remember, I said this is all one story. Now they go across, and we're going to get to that, that and all of that, what happens over there. But they go across the lake, they do something on the other side, and then it says, look at verse 5. 18 of chapter 5, as he was getting into the boat, and Jesus is crossed again to the other. So, so they go across, and then they just get back in the boat, and they come back. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about this. Uh, these two accounts that we're going to look at are kind of sandwiched in between. We're in the middle of this, you know, what, what's going on? Why did they take this excursion across the lake? I mean, it seems like, okay, what was the point of this? And it struck me as I was reading this, they go across the lake and come back. I want us to see, because I think Mark wants us to see that this whole trip across the lake and back is for Christ to show the disciples something extremely important. And by extension, he wants us to see that as well. He not only wants to teach them something extremely important, but he also has a divine appointment. Remember in John, John's Gospel, chapter 4, you're familiar with the story of the woman at the well? And, and as they're heading towards the woman at the well, um, they're, they're not really heading there, they're, they're heading to this region. And, and it says in that scripture passage that, they, that he had to go through Samaria. And as you read through that, and you think to, if you're paying attention to that, you're thinking, actually, no, he doesn't. It makes no sense at all that he would go through Samaria. It's, the, it's about the, most wor the worst route he could have taken. It takes him way out of the way from where he wants to go. But you read through that accounting, and you realize, ah, he actually has a divine appointment. He needed to meet this woman at the well. And we're going to see that really the whole point, one of the whole points of this whole scene is because Jesus has a divine appointment. He has a divine appointment with a prisoner, actually, interestingly enough. He has a divine appointment with someone who's in chains, just like the woman at the well, and he, so he's got to go see this guy. So as they go across the lake, let's, let's get our bearings back. They're in the boat, and they're crossing the lake, and Jesus is totally exhausted. It, he's just so exhausted that he immediately, when they get in the boat and push out, he, he's, he's immediately asleep. And suddenly, a, a tremendous storm comes up. And, and the word great, <laughs> a great storm, is really, you know, we, we just don't give it enough weight. The word that they use in the original language is actually the word they use for hurricane. 
So something violent. Uh, maybe the NIV actually uses the word furious. Uh, a violent storm is what's happening here. This is not just a little bit of wind coming up, all right? This isn't just a nice breeze. There is a tremendous storm. So great is this storm that the waves, are, the water that which would normally be calm and placid has actually got white caps and it's, and it's smashing against the boat. And, and, it's, and, and the water is actually coming into the boat to the point of it filling up. You get this scene that, that fishermen here are getting a little scared. That's the point here. The, the water is just crashing against, spilling in so much to the point where it's starting to fill up. And, and what do the disciples do? You know, they calmly walk over to Jesus and just tap him on the shoulder and say, uh, Jesus, I don't know if you know this, but a storm's coming. You no, know, it's not at all, right? I mean, seriously, that's not at all what they do. They're like, hey, Jesus, dude, what are you going? Come on, come on. We're, we're dying here. That's more like the scene. I don't know if they used the word dude or not, but probably a translation that would have been right for them. Like, man, how can you sleep through this? We are going to die. Don't you even care is the expression that they use. Don't you even care? What an interesting thing. Of all the scenes in the Gospels that I wish I could see. I don't know if I'd want to have been in the boat. I'm not a big fan of the waters like that. But what a scene that would have been to be there and to see all of this unfold firsthand. Just how did Jesus wake up? Did did he jump up in a freak, in a panic and all of that? Or did he like sit up, stretch, yawn, Look at the disciples. Look at the storm. You know, what did, it, what did it look like? I'm just curious. I just wondered what it looked like. And then he looks at the disciples again, and then he speaks. But he doesn't speak to the disciples. What does he do? He speaks to the storm first. That's, that, who does that? Try that next time you're out. And the storm comes. Try speaking to the storm <laughs> and seeing how it responds. It reminds me of a time when uh, was, I was dating Karen, make that clear, and we were out on Canisius Lake on a paddle boat. And it was calm. We got in it, and I told you already, I'm, I'm not a big fan of water, but um, we're out on this little paddle boat. You know what a paddle boat is, the things where you paddling with your feet and all that, and we're moving, and we go out a ways, and you can start to see off in the distance, the clouds are starting to get darker, and you know how it is around here, and it, it just gets pretty dark, and like, all right, I'm thinking, about it. we got to turn around and get back here, so we trying to just gently turn around, and we're heading back, and the storm comes, and, and, and the water is starting to get rougher, and, and there are starting to be those white caps, and we're, we're paddling twice as fast as we were before. And that's because, you know, you work in tandem. And so I was, my feet were going like crazy. I'm freaking out myself here. And I'm like, we got to get back. We're going to die. But all the while, I'm like, this is fun. I don't want to show her what kind of a wuss I am and let her see just how, how I was freaking out hysterically on the inside. But I just was thinking about that. When, when we think about this storm, it uses the word great for a reason because it was a huge storm. And one important study method, when we're approaching our Bible and we see, when we want to understand what the Bible is saying to us, one of the things that is really helpful to do is when you notice uh, repeated words or phrases. And in this section, there is a repeated word, and it's the word great. There was first a great storm, then Jesus speaks, and there is a great calm, and then after the great calm comes what? Great fear. There was fear before, but it noticed that after the calm is when we really notice the great fear in the disciples. Mark's intending something for us to see. That's why he has this in there. 
He's intending to show the reader that there is, Jesus is just not your mere miracle worker. He is God over everything. He wants us to notice that, right? That God in Jesus stands and speaks to the storm because he is over nature. He is over the storm. The one who made it has power and authority over it. That's something that Mark wants all of the people who read it is to, to hear, to see, and to let deep into their hearts and minds that the one who created all that there is is also over it in power and authority. Now those who are just a little bit familiar with their Bibles will remember that there's actually a number of instances in the Bible where God shows his power and authority and control over nature, in particularly how it pertains to water. Um, you could go to Genesis, actually, in chapter 1, is where the first time we see a parting of water. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 6 to 7, when God is creating, it says that the water separated. And so there's just, yeah, okay. But then what about Noah's day? In Noah's day, we see God unleashing water on the earth and then actually causing it to reside. Another great parting of the water. But then there's those literal partings, as we could see in Exodus chapter 14, where Moses and Israel crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. God parted the waters there. And then just a little bit later, we see Joshua and the people of Israel doing the same thing, except this time they're crossing the Jordan River. And, he, and we see God parting the water. And then there's two that I never even I forgot about, actually. When I read through the prophet of Elijah, and he is near the end of his ministry, and God is about to take him up, he gets to the edge of the Jordan River as well. And he strikes the Jordan River with his staff, and God parts that water, and he goes across with Elisha following him, and that's when the chariot comes and takes Elijah to be with him. And then Elisha is left there all alone, and, and he's like... Uh, I'm not sure what's going on here, but I think that I'm, I'm next, if you will. Um, God has put the mantle of responsibility on me. And doesn't he turn around, pick up Elijah's staff, go to the edge of the water and strike it, and God parts the, ri the river again. And so just over and over and over again, we see God as the one who created it, has power and control and authority over it. The passage that Jesse led us in this morning in Psalm 29. It says the voice of the Lord is over the waters. That's why I chose that, because the psalmist is declaring something, that God's command is over the waters. He says the God of glory thunders the Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. And we see that, and that's what Mark's wanting us to see. Mark wants us to see Jesus speak and command the waters. He is, he is illustrating for us what in John's gospel, John illustrates as the word become flesh. All of creation was made through him. Mark is illustrating that same truth for us here, that Jesus is God. Jesus is God. And that's going to come to play in the response between he and and the disciples here in a minute, because Mark wants us to see that, but he also wants us to see that his disciples didn't see that. That's where that goes. Mark clearly wants us to, to draw the conclusion that, that Jesus, as the Son of God, commands and, and, and the waters obey. There was a moment when I was reading through this that I was thinking, that rebuke that Jesus, that gentle I think it was a light and gentle rebuke that Jesus gives the disciples in the boat. Seemed a bit unfair, right? I mean, are they supposed to think from that rebuke? If you, if you hit the pause button there, are they supposed to think for a second that are we supposed to have authority over the wind and the waves? Are, are, were we supposed to speak and, and, and say stop or cease, be still? I mean, I was... Wondering, is that, you know, that seemed a bit unfair. How were they supposed to know 
if that's what they were supposed to do, how would they have known that? But as I was going through it, I, I don't think that it had, I don't think it was connected to the, the wind and the waves. Like they were some, so, somehow, like if you'd have told the waves to stop, they would have if you just had enough faith. Did you ever read it that way? Like, you know, if you have enough faith, you could tell this mountain to jump into the sea, and it would, and, and it causes you to wonder how much faith do you actually have. And here it seems like Jesus is, it almost seems like he's saying, if you had enough faith, you could have done this too. But I don't think that's it. I don't think Jesus' directive regarding what's going on had to do with the storm. I had, I think it has something to do with recognizing who he is. Recognizing who, you don't, he's lightly, gently rebuking them and reminding them or showing them they don't really know who he is. It seems that this light rebuke is aimed at the reality that he's in the boat with them. That he's present and that he is God. They need they need to see that. Mark wants us as the reader to be absolutely shocked the way he writes this. He wants us to be shocked like they were that Jesus was asleep in the boat. But the greater shock that brings great fear is that Jesus wakes up, stands up, and tells the storm to be still. And it does. That's when you read this, it's at that moment that the disciples, it says, were filled with great fear. It's at this point, they're like, I'm in the boat with someone infinitely greater and bigger than I am. And that, that came to them in such a way that it says they were filled with a great fear. They, then they got it. I'm in the boat with the Son of God. And they just didn't, they, they didn't know what to do with that. But I've thought about that too. And I'm just, as I think through these things, as I prepare, I'm like, I think we're like this a little bit. You know, sometimes storms, <laughs> they just come crashing into our lives. Sometimes we can see them coming in the horizon, but often we don't. And it seems they overwhelm us. You know, they start to splash into our boats in that sense. And we feel the need to somehow wake Jesus up to our situation. Like, don't you know, don't you care, God, that this is going on in my life? Because he doesn't act quickly enough or in the right manner. And so we accuse him of not caring. We, we actually are accusing him of, of not being God in that sense. And so you might think of how relieved they all would have been, though, <laughs> as they got to the end of that. And they're finally at the other side. And they're going to get their feet on solid ground. What a relief that would be to have your feet on solid ground. Well, you're going to be wrong if you think that's the relief. They're immediately confronted with a force that makes the wind and the waves seem like child's play. When they get out of the boat on the other side, they're confronted with the force of evil. Let's take a look at that in chapter 5, verse 1. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes, and... When Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Well, I, I got a picture here of what I reckon it looked like. I don't know if we can fire this up. Gail, is that on? We'll see. I don't have anything here. Either way, there was a picture that might have been a little bit like is that David or Daniel? Daniel, sitting up here. There he is. That's not him, but this is probably what the disciples look like when they get out of the boat on the other side. Because immediately, 
as they get out of the boat, when Jesus stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an evil spirit. He lived among the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had been bound with shackles and chains, but he he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. So you're seeing this scene like out of control. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? And so we quickly discover that actually the person speaking is not the man before Jesus, but the demon or the evil spirit that's inside of him. I adjure you, verse 7, by God, do not torment me. For this man was saying, for Jesus was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he replied that my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send him out of the country. But there was a great herd of pigs feeding there on the hillside. And this is kind of a crazy story. And they begged Jesus saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. And so he did. He gave them permission. It's important to notice that, that Jesus had given them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank and into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen, there's those who were there caring for the, sh- the pigs, fled into the city and told the city about it. And, and people came to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion sitting there, clothed in his right mind. And now they are afraid. And he says to them, and he begins to beg Jesus, as they said, As he was getting into the boat, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I skipped fast forward. So he gave them permission and they, and they go into the pigs and they came out and see Jesus sitting there with that man and those who had seen it described to those in the city that they'd gone to see what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might go with them. And Jesus didn't permit him to, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how much he has had mercy on you. And he went away. The man went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis, that's where they're living, how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. Jesus, the disciples in the boat and all those that are in the boats around them, they get to the other side. And just as they step out of the boat, there comes this demon possessed man. And we're we're confronted once again with this scene that seems like totally out of control. A man is charging at Jesus. And as he gets closer, he falls down on his face before Jesus. Apparently, this man had been banished to live in the caves. Uh, The caves, it says, the caves that were in the mountains. He was really, in a sense, imprisoned. They tried to chain and bound him. He'd been so violent toward others that they tried to bind him with chains, and, but no matter how many they put on him, he snapped him like strings. That's the image, that he would take these chains, and I, I'm not sure we appreciate the significance of that kind of strength, so I thought I would give us an opportunity to appreciate that kind of thing. So instead of bringing chains, I thought I could use what you know, just a simple couple pieces of plastic uh, that I thought, well, people could... You know, if they, that guy can break through chains, certainly somebody could 
break through a couple pieces of plastic. Would anybody like to volunteer to get it zip tied? Come on up. There's one in every crowd. Put your hands together. You can do it in front. I won't. You have maybe cross them. I don't know. Any way you want to do it doesn't matter. You, there you go. We'll do it like this. Now I hope that this. I can have some way to get this off. That's not too tight, right? All right. Yeah. Let me just. Yeah. Yeah. Break them. Don't just go ahead. That's not impossible. The guy was breaking chains. If you were the Hulk, yeah, so probably you can't, but this is not a knife. This is just a nice little set of scissors that I can cut that off with. And it's like, oh, now come. I'd ask for another volunteer, but I think you kind of get the point. This guy would snap chains like it was nothing. And so obviously the crowd of people knew about this because they had somehow, they don't tell us how, but they had bound him and got him over there but the demons in this guy were able to overpower any who tried to subdue him. Somehow, like I said, we're not told how they get him over there, but he is over there, and he is, like, totally overwhelming that region. And, and the problem isn't that he's overwhelming the region. What does Mark want us to focus on? The fact that the guy has overwhelmed himself. Mark draws our attention to that. Because this guy is going around and screaming for help. And all the while he's out crying for help, the demon inside of him causes him to do self-harm. It says he's cutting himself with stones. He's doing anything to try and end this misery. And to no avail. I, I don't know what all they tried to do to bring this man under control. But the point of the matter is they didn't and they couldn't. He was out of control. The demons in him, evil in him, is out of control. When he sees Jesus, there is a stark change. And that's the point Mark wants us to just as when Jesus speaks to nature and it obeys, clue, Jesus is going to speak and this evil is also has to obey. He sees Jesus and he comes and it's interesting. We saw this in Mark chapter 1 as well when we saw a demon-possessed man enter into the synagogue. And that person in the synagogue and this person here, the demons inside of these people immediately recognize who Jesus is. And the response to that is what? Down on the ground they go. So we're just moving out of this scene where Jesus gently rebukes the disciples for not knowing who he is. And we enter onto the land and this demon-possessed guy immediately knows who Jesus is. Mark doesn't want us to miss that that little paradox that's going on there. You see, these demons, this evil present, they had pledged their allegiance to their most high God, Satan, the devil. They pledged their allegiance to him until they found themselves in the presence of the Son of God, the true most high God. The demons could only do one thing, kneel and bow and submit. You see, up until this point, they, they'd been overpowering everybody. But now, itself is overpowered just by being in the presence of God. And as the voice of Jesus speaks, he is immediately subdued. That's what we see. We see Jesus speaking to this demon and telling him, commanding him to come out. Three points, three times Mark points out this fact that this power that is inside this person has now been rendered powerless, becomes a spineless beggar 
in the presence of God. Three times it says, Mark says that he begged, but that's all he could do. Jesus, as the one in total control and power and authority over the water, is the same God who's in total control, power, and authority over this demon and evil as well. And he evicts the demon from this man, and he is immediately restored. That's what he wants us to see. That's why Mark puts this in here. We could, I don't want to get sidetracked by talking about that whole pig thing because I'm not sure there's what I could say that would like, oh, that makes sense. It's just weird. I don't understand it. So let's keep our focus on what we're supposed to keep our focus on, I think. A restored man. That's what we see. A restored man. And this guy wants to go, and he wants to stay, not go, he wants to stay in the presence of Jesus. But what Jesus tells him is really important. No, I want you to go back and go back to your family and go back to your friends and tell them everything I did. Tell them about the mercy that I've shown you. And, and that's what he did. It would have been an amazing testimony. You saw this guy coming back into the village and you'd have been like probably a little bit afraid. Like, oh, snap. Uh, how did he get out? Who let him, you know, who brought him off of that? But he comes in in his right mind and he's restored and, he's, and it says he's dressed well. I don't know if it's well, but he's dressed properly. And, and he starts talking about Christ and all that he did for him. And that's, I think, our, the point that Mark wants us to see. Not only does our Savior and King have power over nature, but he also has complete power over Satan. And we, get, we, we need to be reminded of that, that Satan is not an ultimate power. That Satan, the, the enemy of our souls, the one who came at Adam and Eve and has come at humanity ever since, is not in total control. The Son of God is in total control. And that's, Mark is telling this to the next generation of Christians in an hopes that they will build their faith on that anchor. That Jesus is in control. And he's doing the very thing he came to do. He wants us to see that. Because we see in 1 John chapter 3, the reason the Son of God appeared, it says in 1 John chapter 3, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And here we have, not our first installment, but our second installment in Mark's gospel to continue to play that out for us. That Jesus has come to destroy the works of the devil. He's come to destroy the garden curse. But I, again, as I think through these things and I try to anticipate your questions and it's relatively easy because I have some of these same questions, it begs, my, it begs the question, if he has the power to, to overwhelm nature and he has the power and authority and control to overwhelm evil, then why are there still natural disasters in the world that kill thousands of people each year? And why does God not eliminate evil once and for all? I mean, if we're saying he can, why doesn't he? And I think that there's actually two Really good answers for that. I'd like to be able to put them up on the PowerPoint so that we have them. There's two really good answers for those questions. If God has the power to overwhelm natural disasters that wreak havoc on our world or natural the, nat the, the cause of evil in our world, I want to know why doesn't he? That's a good answer. Good question. I mean, the first answer to that is that both 
that which we refer to as natural disasters and evil, we know where they came from. We read in the Bible in Genesis chapter 1 that they come as a result or a consequence of Adam and Eve's sin, that the world was set off kilter and evil entered in, into the world in Adam and Eve in the garden. And God has, in his sovereign, omniscient, for that is all-knowing choice, he's chosen to leave them until the return of Christ, where then he will once again restore all things. It may not be the satisfying answer that we're looking for at first, but it is an amazing answer that somehow, and that leads us to the second part, that God actually, though not actively causing either natural disasters or evil, we said that they are a consequence, he actually uses both for purposes that are greater than we are able to understand. Would I rather that he eliminated those things that wreak havoc on the earth? Would I rather that he eliminated evil? I would say yes. In my finiteness, in my small brainness, I would say yes. But and I would, by, by doing that, if I were somehow to be able to control him, I would be then instead short-circuiting all of the things that he is desiring to do as a result of them and how he is using them even to point others to himself and that how in one day there will be such a great restoration that it will make all of that, the Bible says, seem small. As big as it is, though our light and momentary troubles are preparing for us a glory that far exceeds them all, we believe that. that that's what God is doing. That's why God has permitted to continue natural disasters that are wreaking havoc all across our globe. That's why God in his sovereignty has permitted at his control evil to continue to exist. Now we could, we could go down that road and there will be times where we will on a more concentrated way to talk about. But for now, let's keep these two things in mind. I just want to wrap this up as we start to apply what we see Mark teaching us. That God is in control. He's the ultimate authority over both. There are, I think, five points of application, I hope, that will be clear to us. And the first one is this, that Mark wants the next generation of Christ followers to know with confident certainty that Jesus is in control. That Jesus is in control and has absolute power and authority over all things. And when he acts, he, proves, he shows that. Regardless of of how it feels or appears in our lives through our circumstances or through the situation and circumstances that we find in our world or in our lives. When we get diagnosis and when relationships are broken and when things aren't as they ought to be and when things are just seemingly out of control, Mark wants the next generation, he wants us as Christ followers to know with confident security, confident certainty that Jesus is not asleep in the boat of your life or our world. Secondly, since Jesus has power and authority, not if, but since Jesus has power and authority over these things and he does what he does, then certainly that natural conclusion would be that he, I can trust him. 
I can trust him in my situation. I can trust Jesus in my circumstance today. No matter how difficult they may be. It does not mean that he will immediately calm the storm or immediately make that problem go away. But what we do know is that we can trust him. Thirdly, we know that evil, Satan, and demons do exist. We see that throughout the Bible. And we, and we don't have to read the Bible to know that evil exists, right? We just, we just read the newspaper. And when we read the newspaper, we see that evil exists. Now, we don't always get to the behind-the-scenes look of demonic activity that we are so exposed to in the Bible. But we do know that there is a devil. And we do know that there is a, a large portion of demonic active demons that fell, angels that fell with him, and that they have some kind of power. We know that. But what Mark wants us to know is that scripture, he, they clearly demonstrate that evil is not unlimited in its power. It's not sovereign, but God is. Mark wants us to know that, and that's, he wants us to be comforted and encouraged by that really good news that Jesus has come to destroy the work of the devil. We're once again reminded that it's the work of Christ to cleanse and restore. Cleanse and restore. So even if these two accounts were the only two accounts that the disciples ever had with Jesus, it would be enough to believe and trust and follow. But they aren't the only two experiences, are they? These are just two experiences out of a whole bunch which show us that learning to follow and trust and believe Jesus is, it builds over time and experience. But it's the devil's work to make you believe you can't trust, you can't follow, or you can't believe. Whenever you find yourself in those moments where there is a crisis of doubt, a, a crisis of unbelief, you can know with absolute confidence, two things. That that's being planted in you by the enemy of your soul. And the other thing that Mark wants you to know with absolute confident certainty is that Jesus not only is, but he is God. That's what Mark wants us to know. And that Satan is always seeking to do what? John chapter 10. The thief only comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And if he can kill, steal, and destroy your faith, he'll do whatever it takes. Know that. But he does not have unlimited power. I praise God for that. And then the last thing. Instead of getting into the boat and sailing away with Jesus, which is like, that's appealing. Can I just go commune with Jesus? Can I somehow find a place where I can go to the throne room of God and sit at the feet of Jesus and just rest there and stay there and be there in that place. I want to do that. This guy wants to do that. And he's asked Jesus, can I just do that? Can I just, can I just come with you and sit with you and stay with you? And Jesus' response is, no. No. That day is coming, but I have, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go tell everybody. And he doesn't tell them, go, go tell them the four spiritual laws. You know, the, the, that method of preaching the gospel that points out, you know, these four things. And he doesn't even say to them, I want you to go, I want you to go preach the gospel. He doesn't even say that to the guy. What does he say to him? Just go share your story of what I did in your life. Why do we get so worked up about 
what it means to share the gospel. Like we have to have a plan and a program and this method and this steps. Why do we do that to ourselves? And I'm afraid I'll get it wrong. You can't get this wrong. You see, I was bound. I was imprisoned. I was overwhelmed. And Jesus set me free. That's this guy's story. What's your story? What's your story? And who are you telling it to? That's what Jesus asked us to do. Just go tell him what I did in your life. Show people who I am by telling them what I did in your life. And that's what Mark is doing, right? He's sharing his story. It's just a a crazy good example for us, isn't it? Instead of getting all nervous and worried about how to share the gospel, he just simply said, go go testify to what I did. What an impact that has on someone's life when we share our story like that. And so I just want to close with that thought and encourage you to share our stories. Let's, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these accounts, this narrative of power and control and authority. And that when we see these, we don't see Jesus exerting them to, in some way, for his own cause or good in some way. But no, we see him exerting it in the good, in the salvation and restoration of all things. And we are amazed that I, I did not use this silly phrase, but to understand truly and fully that Christ is in the boat with us, the Son of God who has come to give his life as a ransom for many, to destroy the work of the enemy, to restore all of creation, calls us unto himself, bids us come to be with him and he with us in true communion and fellowship. And we are amazed by this, God. We are we feel small in the presence of Jesus. And we praise you for what you've done for us through him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please stand and we're going to sing.